What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Greg Alexander of Collective 54 and Capital 54. And Greg, before I formally introduce you, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. And another previous guest, uh, John Warlow, uh, he wrote the book Built to Sell. Actually, Greg is a, a great episode on the Built to Sell radio Check that one out. Um, Chris Morsau, he's CEO of Top Grading. Um, they, you know, there's some companies use them to hire A players. They have the book, um, you know, Top Grading, uh, which people use as their Bible for hiring A players. So check that out and many other episodes on uh, inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. Um, at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships. Uh, how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. Uh, we do the accountability, the strategy, and the full execution. Greg, we call ourselves kind of the magic elves that run in the background to make it look easy for the host and the company so they can develop great relationships and create great content. You know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I've found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire on this planet and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com. And Greg has a podcast as well. So you can check that out too. Um, so Greg Alexander, he's the founder of Capital 54. And um, you know they decide which entrepreneurs to bet on and which firms to invest in. He supports entrepreneurs by helping them scale and exit their firms. And he does so by sharing how he scaled and exited his, his own firm. And he's also the co-founder uh, or the founder of Collective 54 Mastermind, community, which helps professional service firms with group and one-on-one -on -one coaching and networking and all of that. Um, and prior to Capital 54 and Collective 54, Greg co-founded Sales Benchmark Index, SBI, which is a professional service firm. It served He served as CEO for 11 years. After scaling the firm, they successfully exited in 2017 for $162 million. Uh, and prior to SBI, he was the executive at EMC Corporation, which is a leader in the data storage industry. And um, also the author of The Boutique, and uh, Greg, I was telling you this before we hit record, um, my, my friend Chris Dreyer told me he read it seven times, and, and maybe I'm misquoting, maybe not, but I think he said this year, seven times. So The Boutique, which is how to start, scale, and sell a professional service firm among other books, and I've told, since Chris has told me that, I've recommended to a number of people, I've listened to it, it's fantastic. So Greg, thanks for joining me. Thank you, it's good to be here. So... I want to start off, we'll, we'll talk about SBI, we'll talk about Collective 54 and Capital 54, but I want you to start off and tell us um, what's Fuck Up Fridays. <laughs> Boy, you know, people can't outrun their past, I guess. Um, all right, well, since we're going to go there, let's go there. Um, so when I had my firm, SBI, um, we, our hiring model was to recruit, recruit into the firm vice presidents of sales from major corporations. And the reason for that is because we sold sales consulting and we competed with the biggest firms, so the McKinsey's and the Bain's of the world. And a point of differentiation was that our, our guys and gals are real practitioners. Whereas what you might see from a McKinsey as an example would be a brilliant person, but you know maybe a Harvard MBA type who never really had a sales quota. Um, and that was a real distinction for us as to why to hire us. Now, the problem is, you know, after someone spends 20, 30 years in corporate America, they're afraid of their own shadow. They run around and they think if they say or do the wrong thing, they're going to get whacked. And our culture was one of just the opposite. We wanted people to take big, giant risk and go for it. And so the way that we celebrated that is we had a ritual and it was very ritualistic. It was called Fuck Up Fridays, and it was a contest, and it was it was a cash reward that went to it, and people would get on a company-wide conference call, and they would say, boy, I got a doozy for you. Let me tell you how I fucked up this week, and 
we would all listen, learn from the excuses and the mistakes and all the things and, and sympathize and empathize and uh, and thank the person, you know, for making a big fuck up because that was proof that they weren't playing it safe and they were going for it. You know, when you do things like that and, and in professional services, which is my area of focus now entirely, you know, culture matters because what are services firms? They're a collection of people. And how people behave with clients, with each other, with themselves, with with each other is, is really important. So that was our way of putting where our money, where our mouth was, and really living that particular value. And I want to dig into the reason I bring that up is because culture, I mean, it really it talks a lot about culture. And so I want to talk about the culture there and what you because you consciously wanted to create a great culture, yeah. and that's what helped you grow your company to help with the leadership. But I do want to dig into that a little bit, which is, you know, we learn from our biggest mistakes. Yeah. What were, do you remember, yeah. what were some of the biggest fuck up Fridays that stick out that we could all learn from? Yeah. Well, I mean, there were several. I'll, I'll give some obvious ones. Um, a lot of times consulting companies are sharing best practices from one client to the next. And many times the reason why clients hire consulting companies is to see what other firms are doing and not have to reinvent the wheel and start with a running start, so to speak. So sometimes there was one in particular where there was a big readout. So imagine a boardroom with a private equity stacked board, a CEO, VP of sales, and three or four of our people in there. And we're doing a big project readout. And he's going through the slides and it was the slides of another client, not of that client. And I mean, we all wanted to crawl under the table. And the client's like, let me make sure I get this correctly. I'm paying you guys a thousand bucks an hour just to repurpose some stuff from somebody else. Like it was really, really, really bad. So that was an example. Um, now, what was great about that example, number one is, listen, <laughs> you got to pay attention to detail. You can't do that. You know, what was the quality control process, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which drove kind of process and methodology. But the bigger thing was, is, is how this individual tap danced in the moment and recovered from it, which was nothing short of a Houdini exercise. And the meeting went great. We ended up getting follow on work. So that's an example. What did, they do? what did they do? They spun it. They said, instead of lying to the client, they said, you're right. I am repurposing work from another client. You're correct. You caught me. However, <laughs> God, this is, I'm, this not is gonna, I'm not going to try to cover it up. I, I specifically picked this use case from another client because of how powerful it can be for you. So let's get past the issue of maybe me being sloppy with the deck creation and let's evaluate the idea on its merit. Here's the idea. Do you think it would work? And the client's eyes just opened right up and it actually was a brilliant idea for that client and they went ahead for it. So in the teaching moment there was, it would have been worse to try to bullshit your way through it. Right? The cover up's always worse than the crime. And they, in this individual, he just owned it and we rocked from there. Um, I love that. Cover up can be worse than the crime. So yeah. what's another one? You, you were going to talk about another one. Yeah. So then there were some that were not so great. Um, for example, we had a guy lie in his expense report. So he, he got on the fuck up call and and talked about how he got caught on his expense report. What I mean expense report, I mean expenses he was fi filing with the client, reimbursable expense expenses. And then he got caught by the client and it was an embarrassing thing. And, and in that case, this was countercultural because we fired him on the spot in front of the entire company when that happened. You know, there, there are fuck ups that are a bridge too far that cross the line. And, you know, and, and that was one. Needless to say, that was a very tense call. Um, you know, we, I didn't believe in having HR in my firm which is a controversial subject, you know, and I, I literally fired the person right on the spot and took the, the uh, legal risk associated with doing something like that. But that even in and of itself sent a message to the team, which is, you know, there are non-negotiables and that's one of them. And if you do that, you're gone, no hesitation. And what really was terrible about it is this individual that did that was a top performer. I mean, a big builder and a big rainmaker, but, you know, we blew him out right there on the spot. And I ended up getting sued. Thankfully, we won the lawsuit. And, and the client, uh, 
in the conducted the deposition and participated in the arbitration with me. So why no <laughs> HR? What what made you make that decision? Well, looking back on it now, I probably would have HR, but you know, I, I was like many of our members at Collective 54, I was a first time founder. And I didn't want anybody in the company that sat between me and the culture. I didn't want an arbiter of the culture. I wanted it to be as real as a heart attack. And I have an oversized appetite for risk, even more so back then when I was a younger man. And I didn't really care about you know, compliance and legalities. And I figured, you know, let's go for it. And if you want to sue me, let's go to war. And uh, that that was the reason why of no HR. <laughs> and it was it was unnecessary and reckless at times, but that was the reason. What else would you have done differently? So you would have, you you know, looking back, you would have had HR. What else? Yeah. Well, the biggest mistake, you, know, you talked about John Worla, who I have a lot of respect for. And I was on his uh, his show, Built to Last. And for those who are listening to this, I encourage you to listen to that. John is doing us all a wonderful service with his show. And uh, I made an $80 million mistake. So uh, I, I sold my firm for $162 million. And, and I don't say that to brag. I say that to say, if I can do it, you can do it. Trust me. Yeah, there's nothing special about Greg Alexander. Um, early on in my company, I gave away too much equity. And when I went to sell my firm, it cost me 80 big ones. So that was a giant mistake. Um, you know, I, I if listened I was to that. Over, I'm do it differently. Yeah, I mean, Greg, I listened to that episode and, um, you know, there's an argument for, I mean, yes, it's an $80 million difference. I, I don't know if I'd categorize the mistake. I mean, you do, but you also attracted great people to your company too. Like, would you have attracted that leadership? If you did, you weren't generous with giving that away. I agree in attracting talent is actually in professional services, nothing more important. And not being a greedy SOB, being a generous person is important. But 80 million is a little, that's a, that's a big <laughs> step. <laughs> I probably could have attracted the same people and had achieved the same outcome for 20 million, you know, instead of 80 million, whatever. So but you know, it was a yeah. There's no doubt that was a huge mistake. But yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, because at that point it was equity. It was. I mean, once you sold, it equated to dollars. You didn't know it was going to equal eighty million dollars. You know. Yeah, of course not. Right. And yeah. and that's the, and that's the lesson for your listeners. You know, if if you're going to bet on yourself, bet on yourself because someday your firm is going to be worth a lot of money. So be really careful in the early days before you have to give up a lot. You know, be really really careful. And thinking through that. Yeah. So HR, be careful with the equity. Any yeah. other things that you would do differently looking back? Uh, you know, I would I would have gone a lot faster. And this is something I hear a lot of people say on interviews like this one. And I used to listen to these shows and try to teach myself these things. And I would hear people say this, and it kind of went in one ear and out the other ear. But, you know, we... My, our point of view expressed in the book, The Boutique, is that it launched to exits about 15 years. There's three stages, grow, scale, and exit. And these are three distinctive evolutionary steps requiring different strategic approaches. And about five years in each stage. Now, I started my firm in 06 and sold it in 2017. So that was 11 years. The reality is I probably could have got it done in like seven or eight. Um, and I'll give you some tangible examples to put meat on this bone. You know, there were there were times where I had made people decisions and I knew it, but I carried them for a while. You know, maybe I held on to somebody a year too long. Um, you know, there were times where I had clients that I probably should have fired because they weren't in our ideal client profile. But, you know, I was worried about making payroll and I carried them and there was real opportunity cost associated with that. So, you know, I'm on the other tough side. Decisions. Of it. It's tough decisions. I know. Yeah. I'm on the other side of it now. And Monday morning quarterback is easy. But, you know. If I was to do it over again, which is what your question, I, I would have not hesitated one second on either of those decisions. Would have pulled the trigger a lot faster. It sound, sounds like at times you did pull the trigger fast. It just yeah. depended. Um, just extreme <laughs> cases. <laughs> um, any other um, fuck up Fridays that stick out that were good learning lessons? You mentioned obviously one that was like a non-negotiable. Like if someone yeah. does something that's just against the core values of the company, but there's another one that 
someone just admitted their mistake. Um, what yeah. other ones stick out over the years? You know, other ones that were really instructive were blown opportunities, lost deals. Um, our business was what we call an elephant business as opposed to a rabbit business. And what we mean by that is we were architected to have a small number of clients, but each client spent a ton of money. Whereas a rabbit business is just the opposite. You have hundreds, if not thousands of clients, but each client spends a little. So when you're in an elephant business, that means every sales campaign is like survive or die. Like these are seven figure type deals. And the losses were extremely painful because, you know, somebody could be working on a deal for a year and their year was made or lost based on that big deal. Um, so when when someone lost a deal because of a fuck up, not because of something outside of their control, but something that they did wrong. And they were vulnerable enough to come into a public forum and say, here's how I blew this one. Boy, those were fantastic because. Lots of people could ask really difficult questions like, hey, in the moment you did this, why? Like, what were you thinking? You know, when when the outcome wasn't what you wanted, how did you recover? You know, how did you prepare for this? And why did you propose that when you were competing with this firm? You know, like, what was your strategy to win? Like, it was there was it was so rich. You know, those lot we call them loss reviews. They were incredibly powerful. And, you know, now that I talk it out with you, I probably would say that. Those were my favorite. Would you remember one, a blown one? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to obscure the client's name. Yeah, that's fine. Obscure, um, obscure everyone's name. Yeah. Was, yeah. There was, there was a, a, probably at that time, the fastest growing company in the world. Um, they were in Silicon Valley. And they were a consumer-focused company. And for the first time, they were becoming a business-to-business -business company. And we caught a huge lucky break and that one of our former clients was hired as a chief revenue officer. And like on day two in the job, he called us and said, come on in, I need your help. And uh, we thought we were all that in a bag of chips and we went in there with a huge proposal and didn't appreciate the fact that he had a reference point from previous work on what our prices were. And uh, caught us speeding, trying to charge too much, and we lost the deal. And that deal would have put us on the map in ways maybe would have even have made our firm a household name. And that was a major, major loss. And that was a very, very powerful and painful loss review. That was the one that got away, so to speak. So, Greg, would you say some of the lessons there, not taking – a relationship for granted or not not making assumptions in if the company is big what what their you know maybe their their budget is i don't know what what yeah. what did you take out of it well all of those yes but i think there's a theme that sits on top of those and that is this was the heyday of our firm and we we, we were really crushing it and uh and we and i'm i'm in this bucket we got arrogant and and we lost the scrappy you know, startup mentality. And we started behaving like the big guys on the team and we got kicked right in the teeth and we deserved it. That that's what happened there. You know, I was listening and you were also on uh, John Corker, my business partner's podcast, smart business revolution, which was great. Um, and he, he said something to you about, it's very meta, right? Your sales process is you're teaching and you're helping people with yeah, exactly. sales. Yeah. What was your sales process like at that time? Well, it was complicated. The first thing was it really wasn't a sales process. This is what's intriguing about it. It was more of a buyer process. So the belief that we had is that services are bought, they're not sold. And there's things in a services sell that are different than a product sell. And our sales process, once we documented it, reflected this. So for example, you can't demo a service where you can demo a product. So that means that you're selling an intangible. And at some point in the sale, you have to ask the customer with no proof to take a leap of faith, right? So getting good at that is really important. With a, with a product sale, you really don't have to do that. You do a demo or someone gets a free trial. 
like the leap of faith just isn't there. The, the product either has the features and functions that you, need, that you need or it doesn't. And services is entirely opposite. So we did a lot of things around helping clients overcome their fear, um, building consensus around a buying decision team, because many times because the, the stakes were high and the fear was high, a lot of the fear was, hey, what happens if this doesn't work? Like, am I going to look like an idiot to my boss? So we would we would get our champion to take us to the boss, include the boss in the decision process. Not and very often we didn't even need to. Like our target client was had the authority and the budget to pull the trigger, but it was a way to help him make a decision sooner because you know we had his back, so to speak. So it was it was very very well thought out. It was constantly iterated against. It was based on the emotional psychology of a big ticket sale in an, in an environment where it was an intangible that required a leap of faith. Um, and it was uh, multi-stakeholder. It wasn't uncommon for us to earn the approval from a dozen people at the highest points in a company. And we would we had a phrase. It wasn't my phrase. It was one of my guys. I, for, I forget who said it. I wish I could attribute it to him. But the, the phrase was slow down and speed up. We used to say that to ourselves all the time. Sometimes we would go fast and we would say, okay, we went from stage three to stage four. It's time to close. And then we'd hit the pause button because we had a central deal desk where we reviewed all this stuff all the time. And we say, wait a minute, you know, we got two or three stakeholders that we're not sure where they are in this. Let's not go for the close yet. Let's go build consensus with them. What was the sales cycle? What was the length of the sales cycle? On average, I would say probably six to nine months on the bigger deals. Sometimes, I, was thinking, I was thinking long. I was expecting you to say longer than that. Sometimes, depending on this, it was very, very much related to the size of the deal. And it was also related to the trigger event. So, for example, we did a lot of work in PE. So if they recently bought a company, the sales cycle would be really short because they wanted to get to work right away. Um, if we were doing work with a big Fortune 500, like I remember back in the day, uh, Hewlett Packard was doing the largest Salesforce.com implementation in the world. It was like 20,000 sales reps. And, you know, we were hired to help them with that. You know, that, that sales cycle took like two and a half years. It depended on the trigger event, mostly the length of the cycle. Like, what was the urgency? Um. What was interesting to me, Greg, too, is one of you were not expecting to sell your company, but right. I like how you thought about the reason why you might as well decide. And it was partial prospecting. Talk yeah. about your <laughs> thought behind we might as well try this out. Yeah. So one of our partners who actually ended up uh, taking over for me as CEO, his name was Matt Shares, and, and Matt built our private equity practice. And it was, it was a growth engine for the firm. And at this time, the amount of money that was being raised in private equity was exploding. And as a result of that, they, we went from like 3,000 private equity firms to like 10,000 private equity firms. So we had a coverage problem. You know, how do you get in front of, you know, this exploding number of private equity firms who are our prospects? So... When we started thinking about selling the firm, I mean, one of the benefits, one of the things that I thought about was, well, a lot of these private equity firms are going to get our SIM, our confidential information memorandum. And it's like the best marketing brochure you could ever have. So when I was working with my investment banker, when we were building a list, who to send the SIM to, we were very strategic. Not only were we thinking about firms that might be interested in actually buying us, but even those that might not be, I wanted to get my name and my story in front of them, right? And uh, it worked extremely well. <laughs> Just for people that don't know, at the time when a company calls you in, whether it's Salesforce or whatever, what what were you actually doing with them? Yeah, so we 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 were a traditional consulting company. So first, put us in that category. But our domain expertise was business to business sales effectiveness. And that's a multiple. What does that mean? So we would determine how much sales capacity you needed. So, for example, how many reps you needed based on what, what was the demand in the market for your product or service. That was a huge kind of data analytics effort. Then we would say, okay, so if you need a thousand sales reps, I mean, what types? Do you need hunters and farmers? Do you need product specialists, industry specialists, et cetera? 
And then this was before COVID where we did belly to belly selling, not Zoom. How are we going to deploy them? Like, you know, how many people do you need in New York City versus San Francisco? And then, you know, what should their quotas be? You know, based on the demand in their local market, you know, what percentage of that demand can you capture? How does that translate to a quota and a compensation plan? It was all this type of work that we did. Yeah, I know, you know, with Collective 54, these are things you discuss with the community and you go over, which is we were talking about culture. All this kind of goes back to culture. And um, you also uh, talk about the life review, I think it was called. The ideal life review. Yeah, the ideal life review. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a cultural uh, component as well. So when you're hiring these VPs of sales in these big corporations, it's tough to hire them because they've got big jobs and big pay packages and they got a fancy logo on their business card and, you know, they can go to the Christmas party and, you know, grandma and grandpa are bragging about, you know, hey, Johnny works for Google, right? Meanwhile, they go to work for SBI and no one ever heard of SBI and it's, it's like a shot to the ego. So we had to come up with an employee value proposition. So think of, if for those that are listening, think of what your customer value proposition is. You know, why would it, what's the problem the customer has? Why is your solution the best for it? And how much does it cost? So an employee value proposition is the same thing. So why, you know, this big shot VP of sales, like what is he unhappy about? And if he comes to work for me, how do I solve that? And and if I do solve that, like how does that show up in his life in, in real dollars and cents and also, you know, qualitative terms? So the way that we would quantify that is we had everybody do what was called the ideal life exercise. So we said, if you had a perfect life, what would it look like? And there were several dimensions, very simply, like, where do you want to live? Um, you know, what type of people do you want to work with? Um, do you want to travel? Um, how much money do you want to make? Uh, what kind of music do you like? You know, all, all kinds. It was very comprehensive. And inevitably, what would come out of it is people would say, you know, I'm 45 years old, I'm 25, 25 years into my career. I got 20 years left. And yeah, I've had some success and, you know, measured in material things, but I'm really not that happy. Uh, I'm not that fulfilled. You know, for example, I got three kids in middle school and I never get a chance to go to their football games because I'm on the road, right? We would hear things like that. So then we would say, all right, well, how can we design your job? And this is the benefits of being in a small company. How can we design your job in such a way to get you as close to that ideal life as possible? <clears throat> Excuse me. Fully knowing that, you know, we can't solve all the world's problems, but maybe we can contribute. So, for example, before it became cool to work from home, we everybody worked from home at at, uh, at SBI. And the reason for that is we said, listen, you're going to you're going to travel a lot. So when you're not traveling on behalf of clients, it makes absolutely no sense to force you to go to an office. You know, when you are home, be home and go go to your kid's ball game. You know, and if that ball game is, is Tuesday afternoon at two o'clock, we don't care. You can make up for it, you know, Sunday morning at 10. Like it doesn't matter to us. So we had a tremendous amount of flexibility and that that employee value proposition. Another huge one was is we didn't care where you lived. We hired this one guy. His nickname was Heater because he was a chain smoker. He was one of my favorite guys. And he was living in Florida, but he was born and raised in Nebraska, of all places. But Nebraska at that time, maybe even now, was not a great job market. And he really wanted to move back to Nebraska, but he couldn't find a job. And the reason why he came to work for us, because he we didn't care, go ahead and move to Nebraska. As long as you got an internet connection and you're willing to get on a plane when you need to, live wherever you want. So that's what the ideal life was all about. And that's how it, it helped us build our firm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, I want to talk about, I like how you talked about, it's not the sales process, but it's the buying process and um, what that looks like for Collective 54. The buying process? Yeah. Yeah. So what happens, so first off, let's talk about our target client. So our, our target client is a founder, typically a first time founder, like 90% of the time, whose psychological profile is they had enough courage to start their own firm. And they're past the startup stage, so they're not worried about survival. But they're wondering, I've got this successful lifestyle business, but I want more than that. I want to move from having a practice to having a firm. And I want it to be something bigger than me. And someday down the road, I want to be able to sell it. That's a very 
specific person. There's approximately one and a half million professional services firms in the United States that meet our demographic profile, which is in pro serve between 25 and 250 employees, but a far fewer number of those that meet that particular profile. Lots of people in pro serve are happy with a lifestyle business. We're looking for people that have big aspirations. So the buying process for those people is very specific. You know, for example, how do they even become aware of Collective 54? Well, somebody with ambition like that tends to be a learner, someone who educates themselves. So what did I do to attract them? Well, I wrote a book. Why did I write a book? Well, learners read. And we spent money on getting that book out there on Amazon with a marketing agency. And as you mentioned at the top of the show, people read the book and they love the book and they become members. That's an example. And that little example is a, is a good one for our show today because it illustrates how you start with the buying process first. Like we identified ambitious people read. Like that's what they do, not what we do. So we want to meet them where they're at. So therefore, I wrote the book. And where do they buy books? They buy books on Amazon. So we showed up on Amazon. So we were matching our selling process to the buying process. Now, just because somebody reads a book doesn't mean they're going to say, sign me up. So they're going to come to the website. That's we know this. That's the next thing they do. Like our audience doesn't go to Facebook, doesn't go to X, ha, used to go to LinkedIn, doesn't anymore because it's so crowded now. They, yeah, they come to the website and they start pecking around. And what do they want to know? Well, as you can see in the main map, they want the very first question when you're selling a membership to a community, it's not what you do first, it's who are the other members. So the very first thing in our navigation is who we serve. And then do they see themselves in that or not? You know, am I in North America? Do I have between 10 and 250 employees? Am I a bold, determined founder, chomping at the bit, the scale, et cetera? And they poke around on the website. Then they, then they want to engage with more content beyond text. So a lot of them are podcasters. Why? They're learners. So we have the ProServe podcast, which is doing well. And we feature members on the ProServe podcast, very similar, Jeremy, to what you guys do. And that they can hear members now, not just read members. They can hear the members talk. It's Once people put those little white earbuds in their ears, it's a different experience. It becomes more intimate. Then our target spends a lot of time on YouTube. So we've got a YouTube channel. And then they want to try before you buy. So we invite them to be a guest in a member session. So these are some of the things that we do. This is how they buy and what we do in response to that. Because if you remember what I said earlier, and it's worth repeating so we can underline it, is services are bought, they're not sold. So the job of somebody in services is to be a helpful facilitator of somebody's decision-making process. The minute you try to sell, it's a turnoff. Talk about, you know, I'm looking at the, and by the way, if you're listening to the audio of this, there is a video and we're showing the collective54.com page. You could check it out there. Um, and I'm on how we do it, right? And yeah. I'm just curious from the first starting Collective 54, what it was in the beginning, and I'm sure you've added things because you got feedback from people, they wanted whatever it is. Talk about some of the things that I'm looking at here and how this was implemented because maybe feedback from the Collective 54 group. Yeah. Well, here we have, we got really lucky. And that is we're standing on the shoulders of giants. So the community business model has been around a long time. And there's people in our space like EO and YPO and Vistage that have been mastering this method for a hundred years. No lie. I think, I think YPO is a hundred years old or something like that. And they have, you know, 50,000 members, crazy. And all mastermind communities, ours and everybody else's, and our last um, look is that there's a little over 600 of them in the United States now. They all have six core features. Now, how you color these features and what these features mean to you might be different, but they have six core features and here's what they are. So the first thing is you got to have a network. So when you join a peer group, a community, you know, if there's no, if there's no peers, there's no community. So you got to have you got to build a really high super quality network. 
And that's hard to do, especially in the early days, because you kind of have a chicken and the egg problem there. But that's the first thing. The second thing is you got to have great content, highly relevant, specific content. Not, you know, chat GPT, mumbo jumbo shit that's created on the internet, like real meaningful stuff, methodologies, tools, case studies, et cetera. Then you got to have data because people come to communities to find out stuff they don't know. So, for example, at Collective 54, these are small business owners. There's not a lot of publicly available data. So, for example, if I'm wondering how much should I charge for my services, how do I know? How much should I pay my people? How do I know? Well, if you're in a peer group, you can find out. You can say, hey, Bob, what are you paying for an engagement manager? Hey, Mike, what are you paying for a junior analyst? Or, hey, I'm pitching ExxonMobil. Anybody else have that as a client? Yeah, I do. Okay, what's your rate structure? Like this is super valuable stuff there around data. Then you need software. And in the community space, that's a community platform. It has the basics like a member directory and activities calendar, et cetera. But what gets really interesting in the um, community platform is the communication between the members in the platform. You know, you can see these really interesting threads. Then you need coaching. Coaching comes in many forms. Like, for example, we have mentors and mentees. So these are members coaching each other. We have group coaching and cohort orchestrated 90-day sprint learning sessions. We have one-on-one -on -one coaching. So, for example, I play that role sometimes. People would like to have time with me. And we have office hours, kind of like we had when we were in college and university. And then the sixth and final thing is you have to have events, which these days are a blend of virtual events and in-person events. So what happens when you become a member is each one of our members gets onboarded. And in the onboarding process, we build a personalized journey for each member based on you know, who they are and what it is that they're trying to get done. And then we support our members with what we call a, a member success manager, kind of like a customer success manager in the software space. And we're, we're monitoring the use of the membership. And we're conducting quarterly business reviews with each member to make sure that they're getting what they need. So that's kind of a very high level 30,000 foot view of what people get and kind of what the journey is. No, I appreciate now, you sharing that. Yeah. And, and Jeremy, we didn't invent that. Like those six features, I don't care which community you go to, they all have some version of those six things. Yeah, for sure. And then talk about your thinking of Collective 54 and how it relates to Capital 54. Yeah. So Collective 54 is the membership community. And at times, um, some of those members are doing very, very well. And in order to, for them to reach their full potential, they need growth capital. So they become the pipeline to my family office, which is Capital 54. So for those that don't know what a family office is, a family office is just like a private equity fund with one exception, and that is the families investing their own money versus investing monies from limited partners. So that's what Capital 54 is. The money that I made at EMC and the money I made at SBI is the capital that we invest there. In addition to that, some of the members in Collective 54 aren't looking for an investment, but they wanna sell their firm and they've never been through an exit before, and they require handholding to, to help them through the exit. So Capital 54 also provides that advisory service to help them do things like figure out who they might want to sell their firm to, what it might be worth, what the terms might be, um, how to pick an investment banker or a business broker, an M&A advisor, you know, how to negotiate an LOI. There's all kinds of things that people need to know you know, in order to exit. So those are the two services that uh, Capital 54 provides. Talk about criteria, right? Because- Investment you know, criteria? Yeah, investment criteria. Yeah. 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 You're like, well, you know what? Who do we decide to fund or not fund? Yeah. So there's, there's two categories of criteria. And the easiest way to think about it is you have the founder and you have the idea. And the debate always for an investor is, what do you back? Do you back the idea? Do you back the founder? So if the investment thesis says I'm backing the founder, you almost don't really care much about the idea. Is you, you think you have located an exceptional human being that is going to be successful no matter what. And you want to get on the train with that person and, and help that person by augmenting their expertise. So that's one uh, investment thesis. Um, the other investment thesis is to invest in the idea, and that is 
The idea is so compelling that even a, a, uh, a mere mortal you know, founder is going to be successful in that space because it's the power of the idea. So that, you know, that's what we're thinking about. Um, you know, there are some other dimensions, you know, for example, I mean, I'm not a billionaire, right? So it's not like I'm writing $100 million VC style checks. So size is a, is a consideration. Um, the stage of the firm is a consideration. You know, we, we tend to invest post startup, but pre-scale. You know, the startups are a little too early for us. Um, but if they're mature companies, it's a little too late for us, as an example. I only invest in services firms. You know, Warren Buffett taught us this concept of circle of competence, which simply says invest in what you know. So I'm only investing in services firms. So these are some of the criteria. Um, is there one that you don't have to name names that you could talk about? And as you think of them, um, maybe... To some people, it, it was they wouldn't have invested in it, but you did because of whatever reason. Yeah, you know there is one where I, I lost money. <laughs> Maybe that's a good one. Back to the earlier part of our conversation. This will be uh, fuck up Wednesdays with yeah. uh, where you lost money. <laughs> yeah. So um, there was a person that I wanted to bet on, and this person was a giant in his field. And he had an idea, and the idea was to build a membership community to support the 7 million executive assistants in the world. And that these executive assistants, the difference between the good ones and the bad ones is really large. And that the CEOs that have a killer executive assistant tend to be a lot more productive. So the, the pitch there was, is you were going to sell to the CEO you know, hyper charging this executive assistant, and then he would get a substantial buyback of time. And I just thought it was a great idea. And I thought this individual was a great individual. So I, I wrote a check, I put $377,000 into that business. Not a huge check, but enough to, you know, catch my attention. And then he recruited his uh, former executive assistant to be the leader of this business. And the business got off to a pretty good start, and then it started to stall a little bit, and we ran into our first adversity, which, by the way, happens in every startup journey under the sun, right? And instead of buckling down and saying, hey, Greg wrote a check here, you know, I've got to get his money back before, you know, I make any decisions, he just quit. And so now, all of a sudden, I go from owner to operator of an executive assistant business, which is not where I wanted to be spending my time. And he abandoned, you know, this person that he recruited in. Um, so I ended up selling the business at a steep loss uh, to her. And she's still running the business right now. And from what I understand, she's making a go of it. But, you know, that was an example of I made a decision to bet on the person. And he was the wrong person to bet on. How do you assess then, you know, in this case, adversity, right? Like you said, in a yeah. business, um, I know that you hire, uh, you talk with John about this, actually. Um, this is one thing I'm, I'm looking at what other things, but you hired athletes. Yeah. Other things you looked at. Yeah. I mean, back in the day, it was, um, you know, growing up in the sales profession, competitiveness was uh, a trait you were looking for in salespeople, particularly new business salespeople. And especially when you were hiring young people, like at Collective 54, we've got a sales team. And I think the average age is like 24 years old. And, you know, so how do you assess somebody's potential on a trait when they don't have a track record? So one of the things we do is we, we were hiring athletes. And, you know, what was their athletic achievements and performance, you know, growing up as a kid and you know, and did they demonstrate leadership capability? Like, were they the captain of the team? Um, you know, did they, you know, not make the varsity the first time and come back and make it the second time? Like, all these types of things is is, is what we were looking for in those scenarios. So, um, you know, in assessing an individual, you know, you mentioned uh, Chris Mursaw and top grading. I don't know if you know this, but Dr. Brad Smart, the creator of top grading, and I published a book together called Top Grading for Sales. I and saw that, yeah. Yeah. 
it's a little old now. It's we've released it in 2008. I haven't looked at it in a while. My guess is it's probably still pretty accurate. But that was this conversation. You know, how do you assess an individual for the role of sales? And and top grading proved very very helpful there. Love it, Greg. I have one last question um, before I ask it. You know, I just want to thank you. Thanks for sharing your journey uh, with all the content you put out with your book and everything. Uh, people can check out collective54.com and capital54.com and the boutique book, which we mentioned. My last question is just resources. It could be groups. I know that like, you're a member of YPL. What are some books or yeah. other resources you recommend to your to your group and others? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Resources. Well, I'm, I'm going to repeat myself a little bit. Um, I think for those that are interested in selling their firm, John Warlow's podcast is a fantastic one. Um, I think for those that are listening to this because of my background in sales and they want to glean something from that, uh, the greatest sales book ever written, in my opinion, was Spin Selling by the great Neil Rackham. So I would drive everybody to that. Um, you know, you know what I find interesting? Um, something that's not often talked about in business circles is uh, the book Think Fast and Slow. Hmm. It's a People often don't talk about it because it's it's very dense and, and very is academic. Daniel Kahneman's book, I think? Yeah. Or, yeah. And oh, it's, it is dense. That's a good way to describe it's incredibly it. Incredibly yeah. dense. Yeah, yeah, a lot of it's, research. and It's work to get through it. Yeah. But, but what it, it teaches the most important skill in life, and that is decision-making. We, we all eventually, our lives are the sum total of the choices that we make. So if you can become a really good decision maker, which is what Think Fast and Slow is about, then your likelihood of success goes up. This book's not often talked about in a business context, which is what we're discussing today. It's it's talked in an academic context or even a behavioral finance context. But that's one that I would point everybody to. And then, of course, the, the, all the podcasts that you guys do and just the podcasting world in general. Um, you know, I, I love listening to podcasts. I, I listen to them all the time. Even I find myself uh, entertaining myself through podcasts. I'm a big fan of Tim Ferriss's podcast. I love Joe Rogan's podcast. You know, those are some of the obvious ones. Any other favorite selling books? You mentioned spin selling. Any other favorites people should check out that you have? Yeah, there's another great one from a friend of mine, Frank Viscata, is called Customer Centric Selling. Um, it's really good for software companies in particular. And it's it's more on this concept that I mentioned earlier about putting the customer at the center of the sales process and understanding how they buy. That's a really good one. Um, one to avoid, in my humble opinion, is the challenger sale. Um, you know, that got a lot of press. But to this day, I, I'm still not sure that got implemented well in a lot of places. And it had less to do with the theory in the book. The theory was very sound, and the authors did a really good job presenting it. But it required some dexterity in the implementation. You know, the idea was to go into a client's office and challenge them. All right. Well, if you don't do that right, you can be labeled a jerk in a hurry. So that would be one maybe to proceed with caution on. Cool. Greg, thank you. Capital 54, Collective 54. Check out more episodes of the podcast. And thanks, everyone. Thanks, Greg. Okay. Thanks, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It reflects between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.